Good morning. Um, today we're doing a teaching video on the examination of the cardiac system. Uh, we have uh, year five MD students. These are our final year students who will be doing their exams in August. And we also have some visiting students from abroad in the audience. Uh, Freddie, one of the students, has kindly volunteered to, to act as the guinea pig or to, um, uh, to demonstrate the uh, normal examination of the cardiac system. Uh, we're going to start as usual with the uh, symptoms and follow it with so-called uh, examination. Uh, the symptoms uh, we will give an overview of and I'll remind the students that the, the main symptoms in the cardiac system are relatively simple to remember because you can group them on their headings. The first grouping is, uh, is the shortness of breath grouping and that includes dyspnea, orthopnea and paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea. The second big grouping is pain. Pain is very important for the cardiac system uh, for a reason you, you, you will see later. Then we have the things that students may forget. Um, you've got um, oedema and then you have palpitations and sometimes you have what we call um, syncope or a loss of consciousness associated with low cardiac output. Uh, I think all students are, are aware that if your cardiac output stops, you lose consciousness immediately, within, within a matter of seconds, you lose consciousness with no cardiac output, that's cardiac arrest. So therefore syncope is, 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 a, is, a, is, is a major symptom. Now, moving back to dyspnea. Uh, dyspnea is probably the most sensitive index of cardiac function. And we start with dyspnea uh, at rest and dyspnea on exertion. I'm reminding the students that it's most important to grade the dyspnea. And you may have to use something practical like I am short of breath when I'm doing the activities of daily living like dressing myself, feeding myself, or I'm short of breath when I walk a certain distance and you can grade the distance, or I'm short of breath when I do more exercise than walking like running or going upstairs. In other words, grade it and, and that's important. Um, all of these um, symptoms have what's called a time course. A time course means we need an onset, we need a, a duration, and we need how it is now. I emphasize those, um, and that's logical. Moving on to orthopnea. Orthopnea is just difficulty lying flat. And people themselves will tend to grade that in saying, I can only sleep sitting upright and uh, they can use pillows or support behind and you have to ask the practical question. Uh, can you lie flat at night when you go to go for sleep? And if not, uh, how many pillows do you use? Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea, or what students know as air hunger, is, is um, familiar to you and for some reason all students like it. I, perhaps it's the, it's the terminology and they all know what it means. Uh, it means waking up in the middle of the night from sleep, short of breath, requiring you to either sit at the edge of the bed or to go to an open window to get relief. And it's all to do with the reaccumulation of fluid from your periphery when you're lying flat. And of course the fluid is collected back into the cardiovascular system and stresses an already failing heart. Moving on to chest pain. Now, pain, what is particular about cardiac pain? Well, number one is position. That's, it's central. If you remember, in respiratory system, the pain is lateral. Now the origin of the pain is central, retrosternal usually, and it can be severe. And here we, we talk about the two main types of cardiac pain. Main types, there are other types. One is myocardial infarction, which is crushing retrosternal pressure, uh, which may radiate and where can it radiate to? It can radiate to the upper limbs, particularly the, the, the forearms, the inside, even the, the hands. It can go to the angle of the jaw or the neck. Uh, it can go to the back, into scapular area, and go to the epigastrium. So radiation is important. And we've mentioned severity, and we've mentioned type. 
associated factors are very important for cardiac pain because there's often a vasovagal response with sweating, vomiting, and um, pallor that characteristically, characteristically occurs with it. Um, the second type of cardiac pain is angina pectoris, or pain that is only brought on by exercise and relieved by rest. And that has to be brought out in the, in the history. Now, associated with, uh, with cardiac symptoms, you may or may not have a cough. <laughs> and I think you recognize this, particularly with palmy edema, where there's a cough which is productive of a white, frothy sputum. Now, we went through cough in the respiratory system, and I'm just emphasizing that the same criteria will apply in the cardiac system as you had in the, the respiratory system. You may have hemoptysis, characteristically in different to failure, you have what's called primary edema with pink or frothy uh, uh, sputum, and that has to be brought out in the history. Uh, moving on to the remaining three symptoms, the oedema, the palpitations, and the syncope. Palpitations is the subject of awareness of one's heartbeat, and that can be related to a normal heartbeat or to an irregular heartbeat. Um, the trick there is to ask the patient about the time course when it comes on, and can the patient show you what they mean by the irregularity? And most patients are able to tap out the irregularity, like. And that's a little simple way of, of involving the patient in the, and getting more information from the patient. As regards oedema, it's self-explanatory swelling of the legs. Please remember that when you go to bed at night, the, the oedema may get displaced to your sacrum. The patient won't tell you I have oedema of my sacrum because we don't look back there. That's where the doctor looks when he does the examination. And lastly, syncope. Well, syncope is loss of consciousness, and the classical cardiac condition that occurs in are low output states, aortic stenosis or uh, cardiomyopathy, particularly hypertrophic, but it can occur in uh, patients on antihypertensive medications, patients whose blood pressure drops suddenly, like uh, pericardial effusion or low output state. So uh, syncope is, is uh, straightforward. Most patients actually don't lose consciousness. What happens is they get a subjective awareness of being very, very dizzy, and they are able to alter their position by sitting down and stopping themselves goes unconsciousness, goes unconscious. But please remember that syncope uh, associated with either a heart block like, uh, or with aortic stenosis is sudden. It's called Stokes Adams attacks and occurs usually without warning and can be very severe. So in summary then, we've mentioned to you the, the main symptomatology that, have to, that one has to look for. Now moving on to the rest of the history, and I won't labour it today. Past medical history is going to be all about diseases affecting the cardiac system that you want to know about. Please remember, in all past histories you have to know, does the patient have any active disease? Have you ever been in hospital and for what reason? And when? And have you ever had an operation and for what reason? Specific cardiac diseases that you can require about is any previous heart disease, any hypertension, any diabetes. Was there maybe a history of um, rheumatic fever, which is usually not present, but there may be a history of rheumatic heart disease? Um, so you emphasize that. Um, moving on to family history, we tend to concentrate on first degree relatives, i.e. parents, what we call um, siblings or children, and our uh, uh, brothers and sisters, and ask again, do they have any of the risk factors for heart disease that might run in families? For example, hyperlipidemia, for example, diabetes, and hypertension. Social history is important in the sense of uh, smoking and drinking are major risk factors. And now the latest one on the block is lifestyle. lifestyle, And that includes diet, and includes calorie intake, and includes exercise. So you have to uh, accumulate those together. Obviously, occupation is important, depending on the type of exposure, just like it was in lung disease. Um, 
The others, the drugs, uh, here it's very important to document the drugs they're on, the dosage and the frequency and are they still taking them. Allergies are obvious and systems review um, you know about. So that concludes the symptomatology of the cardiovascular system. Thank you. So now we're going to proceed with the second part of the uh, cardiac examination, which is the, uh, the actual physical examination of the, the heart and the cardiovascular system. Please remember the cardiovascular system is wider than just the heart. Uh, involves the, the great vessels and the consequences of disease affecting them. To start with, your patient um, should be undressed to the waist and should be lying uh, usually on a couch at 45 degree angle. That's where we examine the JVP from and that's where we examine the uh, precordium from as a rule. Uh, sometimes the patient is sitting uh, in a chair because the patient is not in a bed. Today, um, our student Freddie is, is, is sitting upright uh, for this examination. Um, I'm just reminding you that just like the respiratory system, you inspect from the side and from the front. The front would be the end of the bed, or in this case, in this position, looking from the front. Um, the, the, next, the examination then uh, moves on to the... Um, it, once your patient is positioned, then we move on to the examination of the cardiovascular system proper and it involves the the heart but also peripheral parts that students may or may not forget now no student forgets examining the pulse in the cardiovascular system and that's considered to be part of the cardiovascular system proper like blood pressure like JVP so they're included in the so-called we call it the, the examination of the cardiovascular system proper. The bits that may, you may forget are the, the legs, where we're meant to check for edema and for peripheral pulses. The hands, and I, by this now I mean the, finger, the fingers, looking for clubbing, uh, cyanosis, um, occasionally complicating bacterial endocarditis. We may see a little um, lesions, uh, splinter hemorrhages, or little uh, ocellus nodes, as they call them, little punctate little nodes that are embolic in nature, or Janeway lesions on the palms. So we are meant to carefully look for those things on the, on the hands. Um, coming up to the head and the face, the things that students may forget is to look for anemia, because it will inform you about the cardiovascular system. Just like polycythemia may be a consequence of a cardiovascular disease, like uh, uh, cyanotic heart disease. <coughs> and of course, in our environment, we see so many sick patients that uh, the eyes may inform you from, from the point of view of jaundice, i.e. in congestive cardiac failure with hepatic congestion. The mouth is very important for two reasons. That is where we see peripheral and central cyanosis. And peripheral cyanosis is seen in the lips, in this case he's not cyanosed, and then open the mouth, put your tongue out, and his tongue is normal. The tongue is where we look for central cyanosis. All students know that you, you only get cyanosis when you get greater than 5 grams of hemoglobin dissociated from, um, from, from with dissociated hemoglobin or, dis or hemoglobin that doesn't carry um, the normal amount of oxygen. Therefore, you can't get the sign if the patient is anemic and we see a lot of anemia in our environment concurrent with heart disease so it's a sanitary point now we've we've done the um, the the peripheral bits the abdomen is, may also be involved in cardiovascular system if the patient has hepatic congestion with a liver which is uh, abnormal or uh, what we call enlarged you may see ascites in severe congestive cardiac failure and you may see a spleen complicating some uh, acute disorders like bacterial endocarditis uh, uh, or maybe some other diseases that may inform you about the cardiovascular system. I'm emphasizing that the peripheral parts do play a role and I've emphasized the bits we're meant to examine. In summary, the, the feet, the hands, the head and face and the abdomen. Now we go on to the examination of the cardiovascular system proper and start with the pulse. There are five major things that we have to remember about the pulse. One is rhythm, rate, 
volume, character, arterial wall, and lastly, whether the other radial pulse is present. I'll re-emphasize those. The rate is self-explanatory. Anything above 100 is tachycardia, anything below 60 is the bradycardia. The rhythm is important, whether the pulse is regular or irregular. And students tend to like this because when we describe irregularity, it can be two types as well. We kind of reverse ourselves. Regularity can be regular or irregular. An example would be a one in four beat drop would be a regular irregularity or a one in two beat drop, like in bispherials. And of course, irregularly irregular usually implies atrial fibrillation on multiple ectopics. So rhythm informs rhythm volume informs you. And that's where we see two characteristic abnormalities. The volume reflects the stroke volume in the left ventricle and is best, is best felt by gently pressing on the radial arch, gently, and feeling the volume that impinges onto your fingertips. The volume, as I say, can be normally decreased and sometimes increased and uh, are altered in, in terms of um, uh, rhythm. For example, pulses alternans, every second volume is decreased. That's a left ventricular failure. Pulses paradoxes, the volume decreases on inspiration, such that it may disappear completely. And that be confirmed, can be confirmed by measuring the blood pressure at the same time. So I'm emphasizing that and volume can be increased in high output states like pregnancy, anemia, tartic psychosis, and of course, aortic incompetence, where you, where you feel a full volume pulse. So we've done rate, we've done rhythm, we've done volume. Now the one that causes students problems, character. And I will summarize these two. Character is what makes uh, a pulse distinguish from other pulses. Um, the, the three main pulses that can be picked up at the wrist are as follows. Number one, an anacrotic or slow rising pulse that occurs in aortic stenosis. Number two, a collapsing or water hammer pulse, or Corrigan's pulse, that occurs in aortic competence, and the combination of both, bispherians, where you feel a slightly double impulse. Um, there are other characteristic um, pulses, but I think that is sufficient for today. The feeling the vessel wall and the other radial is self-explanatory. I'm going to move on now up to the neck, for the next part of the uh, demonstration. The blood pressure is measured, and you're all aware of how to do that. Coming up to the neck. This is, uh, this is an area that students may find difficult because this is where we see an elevated jugular venous pressure. But the first thing a student will see will be a pulsation in the neck. The patient is lying at 45 degrees, there's an obvious pulsation in the neck, your job is to decide whether this is arterial or venous. We have a method for distinguishing the two as follows. You start with inspection and you look at the pulse. Number one, you look at the actual, whether the pulse is localized to one area like an artery or spread over a wide area like a vein. Therefore, diffuse suggests vein, localized suggests artery. Number two, you look at wave four. A venous wave reflects the cardiac cycle in the right side of the heart and will contain an A wave and a V wave which is easily visible. There's also a small C wave due to transmitted carotid pulsation. We call that the AC as opposed to an artery which is a single, obviously a ventricular contraction, single wave form. And lastly, the venous wave will decrease on inspiration or vary on, 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 on respiration, whereas an arterial wave is not affected by it. So on inspection, you can easily distinguish uh, an art a vein from an artery. Now we move on to palpation. If you have, if you're still having difficulty, you can actually um, place your finger at the root of the neck, and you can easily occlude a. Uh, and a, a vein. You take your finger away, please place your finger horizontally at the root of the neck, press gently, and you can easily 
occlude the vein, whereas you cannot occlude an artery. The artery is a midline, paramidline structure, and you would have to use a huge amount of pressure to occlude an artery. And of course, we don't do that. Um, lastly, you can do the hepatojugular reflux. Um, if you press gently with your hand, and I've, I emphasize you place your full hand over the epigastrium and the uh, spanning, if, as much as you can, of the, the left lobe of the liver and the right lobe of the liver, and you press gently and you'll see if the JVP is, um, if, the, if the pulsation is a vein, then that vein will distend and uh, will become obvious. So I'm emphasizing that the difference between a vein and an artery can be distinguished clinically, and that is an exercise every medical student has to know. Moving on then to the, to the cardiac examination system proper. The routine we follow is the same as for respiratory. Inspection, palpation, percussion in brackets, and auscultation. Now what are we going to inspect? Well, you're interested in the apex beat, and um, you're interested in any abnormality that you see in the precordium, for example, if the chest wall is deformed, you're interested in any pulsations that you see around the precordium, or any other abnormality that strikes you. Please remember that you've already described the patient in your general assessment. The general appearance of the patient has already been described. Now you're looking specifically at, at the cardiac uh, inspection. It's done from the front, and as I say, you localize the apex beat, if you can see it, any abnormal pulsations or any other abnormality that strikes you. The important bits about palpation are as follows. Number one, we, we do palpate the, trache the trachea just to make sure it's in the midline, that the mediastinum is in the midline. The most important bits, I think, from the point of view of a student are the apex beat, uh, the precordium for pulsations, and then you need to check for the presence or absence of a thrill. Now the way we do that is as follows. Checking for the apex beat by palpation. The patient is lying at an angle of 45 degrees, and we usually just, just put your hand over the, um, what we call the apex or the mitral area, which is the fifth inch space, midclavicular line, and you feel for any uh, abnormal pulsation. And the problem is, what do we do when we feel it? Well, then you have to describe its location, how forceful or how weak it is, whether it is localized, like or diffuse, and then, is there any other associated character that you can feel like a thrill or possibly a palpable sound, like a palpable first heart sound or a click? So I'm reminding you that the apex beat, you describe its position, whether it's localized or diffuse, and then any other abnormality, such as a thrill or possibly a palpable sound. Having completed the apex beat, I should say this, the apex beat is sometimes examined lying flat as well, with the patient lying recumbent or lying flat. The reason for that is you may get more information. Now, in, you've always been taught to examine the apex beat with the patient sitting upright at an angle of 45 degrees, and that still stands. Moving on then to what we call checking for precordial pulsations, you just put the flat of your hand on the left side of the sternum, to feel any, and you may feel a pulsation onto the palm of your hand, that way, particularly here where the right ventricle is. And then, checking for thrills, you check over the base of the heart, <coughs> over the left parasternal edge, and the flat of your hand now, not just your two fingers, over the whole apex of the heart. That way, you feel for thrills. Palpation then is complete. The next part of the examination involves percussion. Now in practice we do not percuss hearts, but we can. 
So how could we percuss a heart and when should we percuss a heart? Well, you might percuss a heart if you suspected that the heart size was very, very enlarged and you could pick it up clinically. The best example would be a large pericardial effusion. Cardiomegaly, yes, but probably less so than pericardial effusion. It's very simple to do. And most students are aware that there is an area of precardial, what we call dullness, that what we call underestimates the size of the heart. That is, it's small in the precordium, and that corresponds to the heart when you percuss. So let me demonstrate the way you would percuss. Well, let's imagine that, that uh, Freddie's heart is here. He has a border here, the right border. He has an oblique border on the left side, which is at right angles to his shoulder, and he has an inferior border there, which lies on his diaphragm. All you do is percuss per perpendicular to the borders as follows. Listen. You hear the dullness? And now going to the left shoulder, you does perpendicular to the You hear that? And then from below up, you can percuss as well in the same way. I can do it parallel or perpendicular parallel with my finger or perpendicular. This is parallel because it's easier if you listen. Resonant. Now, in some respects, uh, his, he will have a small area of dullness there that will, will underestimate the size of the heart. As I said, it's useful only when you suspect that there's massive cardiac enlargement and not routinely practiced. Now, I won't say any more about percussion. We move on then to auscultation. Now, as I said, auscultation is considered to be the most difficult part of examination for medical students for good reason, that it's not easy. The patient is lying at 45 degrees. You are going to listen at what we call four areas. And the, the areas are the mitral area, which is the apex beat, the aortic area, which is the second interspace to the right of the sternal edge, the pulmonary area, which is the second interspace to the left of the, of the sternal edge, and the tricuspid area, which is the fifth interspace to the left of the sternal edge. That's, these are the four areas. In practice, most people listen at two areas. They listen at the apex and the aortic area. But let's imagine that we're going to listen at his, um, to his precordium and we start at the mitral area, okay? The apex. What am I going to listen for? Well, the first thing we listen for are heart sounds, S1 and S2. The loudest sound at the mitral area is always the first heart sound. So when I'm listening there with my stethoscope and I hear a loud sound, I know that is the first heart sound. I'm going to use that to time my murmurs. If I, on, on the other hand, if I listen in the aortic area, and uh, the loudest sound in the aortic area will be the second heart sound. So I'm going to time my murmurs around that knowledge. Please, I am emphasizing that students must know heart sounds before they look for murmurs or any additional heart sounds. <coughs> so let's look at Freddie's, uh, let's listen to Freddie's heart for a minute and see what do I hear. Lub dub, dub dub, dub dub. Lub dub, loud first heart sound. Up here, lub dub, dub. Dub, dub. In other words, a loud second heart sound. I'm emphasizing the importance of heart sounds. That's the way we localize our murmurs. The other way we localize our murmurs is by palpation. Let's say he had a murmur and I could feel at his radial, but the gap between, the timing between his output and his radial is, is a fraction too long to use it to say that the murmur corresponds with it. So we're meant to feel his carotid artery, which is here, at the same time then as I'm listening to the murmur. Let's imagine he has a systolic murmur. Now the two are happening at the same time. Pah, 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 pah. 
So we time our murmurs by two methods. One is palpation and the other is localizing it around the first heart sound. I emphasize again that the cardiac cycle begins at the apex with the first heart sound, closure of the mitral and tricuspid, and it, um, it ends with the second heart sound, which is the closure of the um, aortic and the pulmonary. The first heart sound is always louder than the second heart sound. Therefore, any murmur that occurs after the first heart sound and before the second heart sound is systolic in timing. In the same way, <coughs> you up here, that you'll hear two sounds, the second heart sound being the loudest, and in this case, the first heart sound is the closure of the mitral tricuspid, and the second heart sound is the aortic and pulmonary, but in this case, the second heart sound is loudest, so any murmur occurring before the loudest sound is systolic in timing. Now, using that technique, we can, we can actually localize our murmurs. Coming on to murmurs then. But before I do that, I should just dismiss additional heart sounds. There are at least three separate types of additional heart sounds that are common. One is a third and a fourth heart sound. Two is um, uh, what's called an opening snap that occurs in mitral stenosis. And three would be a pericardial friction rod. Going back to the um, additional heart sounds, a third heart sound is a diastolic sound that occurs during filling of the ventricle, passive filling of the ventricle, and is sometimes audible in young people, children, uh, maybe in pregnancy or high output states. Uh, it can also be audible in a failing heart, usually, in, and in that case, it's considered, um, if it's coupled with a fast heart rate, we can often hear it as a gallop rhythm. A gallop rhythm would go something like this. It would go, and then it was a gallop, gallop rhythm, an extra sound. That's usually a third heart sound. As I said, a diastolic sound due to passive filling of the ventricle, which has, is already full of blood because it's not emptying properly. It creates a sound. In the same way, atrial contraction in diastole can create a sound that's called a fourth heart sound that occurs at the end of um, diastole, and that's always pathological. An opening snap is what happens after uh, the um, second heart sound due to opening of the mitral valve and it can create a sound if it's tethered or tight, a little snap, and that will occur before the, the murmur, and you may hear that in mitral stenosis. And finally, a pericardial friction rod. These are superficial sounds and they're often systolic and diastolic in timing, heard best with the flat or the diaphragm part of the stethoscope, usually with the patient leaning forward and in expiration. And you may have to listen over the precordium at a number of sites. That's a pericardial friction. These are the additional heart sounds. Now, moving back to murmurs. There are at least five or six main points that students need to remember about a murmur. Number one, where is it? It's sight. Number two, is it just confined to that site or does it radiate in a certain direction? Number three, it's timing, whether it's systolic or diastolic, and I've explained to you how we do it. Number four would be um, the, what we call the quality of the murmur. The mur there is some quality about that murmur which makes it distinctive. For example, mitral stenosis is a, a rumble or what we call a, a low-pitched sound a rumble, whereas mitral incompetence is a high-pitched blowing sound, and aortic stenosis would be uh, what's called a harsh ejection type murmur, and aortic incompetence would be a deep crescendo soft blowing type, a uh, soft murmur. So the, the character of the murmur is important. 
The loudness of the murmur is important and there are six grades of loudness beginning with one is audible by an expert, two by an ordinary person like you or me, and three would be an obvious murmur, four would be an obvious murmur with a thrill, five is a, a murmur heard all over the precordium with a thrill, and six you can hear it with your ordinary ears. I've emphasized the, the uh, microstenosis in the left lateral position. Um, aortic incompetence leaning forward, breathing <coughs> out. And finally, which part of my stethoscope do I use for auscultation? In principle, we use the diaphragm, or the flat part of the, the stethoscope, for everything except mitral stenosis. That's an easy way of remembering it. Now, I've completed the, um, the um, examination of the cardiac system. Thank you. <laughs>